Growing up as a PK, um, I was not really allowed to participate in all of the fun festivities that everybody else would participate in, right? Because you're the pastor's child, okay? So instead of saying, mom and dad, can I go to the party? I would say, my friends are having a fellowship. <laughs> I said, my friends are having a fellowship. Um, I'm about to graduate in two weeks. I'm 18 years old. I'm on who's who of American high school students. So can I go to this fellowship? And my dad said, yeah, you can go, but you gotta be home at 11 o'clock. Somebody say, what? I'm 18, 11 o'clock? You know, like in the summertime, like around April and May, it don't really get good and dark till like 8.30. I'm like, at least give me till midnight. Now in high school, I was on the step team. And so we went to this like fellowship and everybody was kind of turning up, but it seemed the closer it got to 11 the more hype the party started to get. That ever happened to y'all? Like when you know you gotta go, it seemed to start getting more turned up. Like it was kind of dull at nine. At 10, it started turning up. And then at like 10, 50, everybody was like, come on, Jay, let's go, let's go. Everybody's all excited. But my daddy told me to be home at what time? My daddy told me to be home at what time? So I decided I'm about to graduate. I'm on who's who of American high school students. I'm gonna get home at 11.30. I graduate, don't you, I feel so judged. <laughs> I'm gonna get home at 11.30. So at 10.59, I promise y'all, my dad had to have the phone in his hand. And my phone started vibrating at 11 on the dot. Mm, mm, mm. And so what do you do when you're at a party and you're supposed to be home at 11 o'clock, but you made your mind up to be home at 11.30, what do you do? You don't answer it. I feel so judged. <laughs> I'm saved now. Um, so I, I, I ignored the call, and then my daddy called again. You start to get kind of nervous once your dad calls you twice, right? And so they're all in line and like, come on, Jay, let's go. Everybody's trolling. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And I'm like, yeah, I got to go. I got to go. I gotta... And so I'm trying to enjoy it. And they're like, Jerry, just, just, just come on and turn up. But I really couldn't. You know why? Because daddy was calling me. And I wonder how many of us are trying to enjoy it and enjoy it. But you really can't because your daddy is calling you. You really can't enjoy where you are. You really can't enjoy the activities because you know God is calling you out of something. So this word on this afternoon, it's going to call some people out. <laughs> Ooh, your neck. <laughs> your throat, not your throat, your throat. It's going to call a lot of us out. Also, I want to give a huge thank you to you, Version, who has allowed me to be on the verse of the day today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm always grateful um, when God allows me to speak on his behalf because he didn't have to. And so I'm just honored to be able to inspire so many people by the beauty of the gospel, not my efforts. I'm flawed and imperfect, but I'm just thankful for what God is doing throughout the ministry and in this church. So I want to get to work. Is it all right if I do that? I want to go ahead and get to work. Let's speak around this thought from this subject for a few moments on this afternoon. I can't heal it if you hide it. I wonder, are there any people in the sanctuary who are playing hide and seek with God? I can't heal it if you hide it. And there's a confession I want us to say, and then we're going to pray and get to work. Can I get everybody to say this, and everybody watching online, put this in the room in all caps. Can I get everybody to say, my scars, my scars. are not my labels. Their proof, Their proof that I survived, survived. great is coming. Great. One more time, my scars, my scars. are not my labels. Not my labels. Their, proof Their proof that I survived, survived. greater is coming. Greater. Father God, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this time of just being able to come together and feast on your word, grow in your word. I thank you that this will be a spiritual edifying word. We had worship 
that says, God, come in this house and get yourself some glory. Worship is the red carpet that says, everybody, let's get our focus and let's get our attention to the king of glory. This is not about man. This is not about my efforts, but this is about you. And I thank you, Father God, that all the study means absolutely nothing. If you are magnified, if you are glorified, make me invisible so that you are seen as visible. Would you use me, oh God, as your oracle? And God, we also pray for Ukraine and all of the violence that's happening all over the world. You are the peacemaker. And we pray, God, that you stand and you protect your people so that ultimately, God, you get the glory. Would you have a hedge of protection around your people, Father God? We love you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you shout amen? Amen. We are now in part eight. Installment number eight. We have been two months in this thing. We now are in lesson eight of this amazing sermon series entitled King Encounters. And on today, what I would like to do via the scriptures, not my opinion, I want to show us via the scriptures that there is a side to Jesus. <laughs> there is a side to Jesus that many times is left out and overlooked when we come to his person and his personality. There's a side of Jesus that goes overlooked, underpreached, and undiscussed when we talk about his person and his earthly ministry. And it would be just remiss of us. Like, we would be up here for the rest of the evening. There are a plethora of definitions that we could attempt to use in an attempt to articulate how awesome and how mighty and how magnificent and how powerful and how indescribable and how inexhaustible and how invincible and how incredible Jesus truly is. We would be here the rest of the day. The rest of the month, if I were to ask everybody to tell me your definition of how awesome Jesus is. The Holy Spirit has been constructing this message, and I'm just grateful to be the spokesman. I don't have to hit the game when it's shot. I just want to wear the jersey of Team Jesus. Anybody else? I just want to wear the jersey of Team Jesus. I'm grateful and my heart is filled with joy this afternoon because, number one, God got me. And then for number two, God called me out. Y'all going to leave me out here? Is there anybody thankful that God called you out? Maybe I need to put my foot on the gas a little more. Like some people did the same things that you did, but they didn't get the same grace that you got. I don't know why God was so gracious to me. God was calling me out. This message is going to call you out. Anytime you get called out, and the message is convicting, <laughs> and the back of your neck is hot, and your palms are sweaty, and you feel like you got gas all in your stomach. That's not gas. That's not them tacos you ate. That's not a burrito. That's not that. What it is, is God revealing to you, you're made for more. That's all conviction is. That's all conviction is. It's God's way of revealing to you, you were made for more. You were made for more than this. This is why you can't get comfortable in this. You're made for more. You're made for more than just being exhausted and stressed out by working on a nine to five. You've been made for more. You've been made for more than just believing what somebody says about you and have that alter your personality. You were made for more. You have been made for more than just paying bills, retiring, and dying. You were made for more. You're not your mistakes, you were made for more. You're not your shortcomings, you were made for more. God wants to remind us that you were made for more. And the Holy Spirit has qualified all of us for a full upgrade. The question is, will you take the upgrade? Like, have you ever noticed how God always levels things up? It's like, you're not just blessed. Let's level that up. You're blessed and highly favored. It's like he always levels it up. You're, you're not just anointed. Let's level that up. You're anointed and appointed. Oh, don't run up on me. I promise you don't want it. Have you noticed how God levels you up? You're not just a conqueror. Let's level that up. You are more than a conqueror. God wants to upgrade your life. But I would be guilty of ministerial injustice if I did not tell you that it comes with a fight. 
It comes with the fight. You're not just going to become this awesome woman of God without a fight. You're not just going to come this kingdom man without a fight. But I got good news this afternoon. The fight has been rigged. Talk Holy Ghost. The fight has been rigged in your favor. So you're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. Y'all better come get me. The fight has been rigged in your favor. The only way you don't win is if you don't fight. It's a fight. Oh, it's a fight. It's a fight for you to not dig up in doubt what you planted in faith. That's a fight. Let, let's not be churchy. It's a fight for you to trust God's timing. Especially when you feel like heaven's UPS is going to everybody else's address, everybody else, like their packages on the porch. Am I talking to anybody? It seems like everybody else, God hears their prayers on priority, but with me, he takes his time. It's a fight to trust God's timing, even when you feel as though God is taking his time. It's a fight for you to know. That in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your storm, that you have an all-sufficient Savior that's walking on your circumstances with you. And look at this, y'all. He won't just walk on it alone. He'll invite for you to walk on it with him. I wonder, do you have enough faith that you're not like people who are in the boat of doubt? They're too scared to take a faith risk because you can't have faith and not take a risk. I'm looking for people who are willing to take the risk and almost embarrass themselves because it's really not faith if you could not look stupid. I need to take a risk and walk on the waters of the unknown and walk on the uncertainty with Jesus, walk on the turbulence with him because watch this, turbulence is only given to those who are flying. Did y'all hear what I just said? Did y'all hear what I just said? Turbulence is only given to those who are flying. So the quintessential question on this afternoon is, are you just looking at the turbulence or are you looking at the altitude? If I didn't need it, I'd throw it, but I got a whole lot more to say. I need my towel. Which one are you looking at? The turbulence or the altitude? I promise if you were to pause for a second and just look and evaluate what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life, you would see that you're growing. You're so hard on yourself that you have blindfolded yourself from the fruit that the Holy Spirit is producing in you. Oh, I promise you growing. If you just look at yourself, you'd be like, man, if that would have happened to me two years ago, I would have lost my mind. If, 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 if she would have came at me with that type of energy six months ago, I would have cussed her clean out. I didn't say curse, I said cuss. Some of us are creative cusses. <laughs> I just hope that's a used to, not a still do. <laughs> if that would have happened to me three months ago, that would have rattled my faith, but I have learned how to roll with the punches. I have learned that opposition many times is a sign that I'm in position. So good job. I told you I was happy studying it. Come here. Remember, I told us three weeks ago when Jesus said, let us go over to the other side, the disciples encountered a storm of hurricane proportions. So they encountered opposition by listening to Jesus. They encountered opposition by following Jesus. They encountered opposition by doing what Jesus told them. Sometimes opposition is a sign you're in position. So if I could, let me change your perspective. Don't be confused from it. Be confirmed by it. Oh, this is so good, y'all. Don't be confused from it. Be confirmed by it. Because I can't speak for nobody else. But when I was living how I wanted to live, when I was living in sin and I was just turning up how I wanted to turn up, I had friends. I was invited to the, like the, the party, like that Super Bowl party they had a few weeks ago. I would have been invited, but it seems like ever since I had my king encounter, friends have fell off and devils have showed up, yeah. right? Yeah. Don't get confused from it. 
be confirmed by it. Don't let the turbulence rob you of your progress. Don't let the turbulence bury you underneath the soil of disbelief. Stop sharing seats with insecurity and doubt. Sometimes you have to talk to yourself. I am the head and not the tail. See, listen, y'all. I don't understand. How is it you got clapped back to everything else but your problems? Sometimes you got to talk back to your problems. I am the head and not the tail. Y'all don't mess with me. See, listen. I know I'm new school, but I grew up old school, and there was a song that the church elders and the church mothers used to sing while I was seven years old, sitting on the front row. They used to say, sometimes you have to encourage yourself. It came from a passage of scripture. When David was at Ziglag and he lost his wife and his men lost their wives and their possessions and everybody was so distraught that they thought about turning on David. The Bible says that David had to step off to the corner for a second and encourage himself in the Lord, not in his following, not in his bank account. See, this is why some of us are so discouraged because you're trying to encourage yourself in forms outside of God. Sometimes you got to encourage yourself. If you don't know what that looks like, just watch and take notes. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed going and I'm blessed coming. I am a disciple taught of the Lord. Obedience to God's will. Great is my peace and undisturbed composure. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will live and not die, but declare the works of the Lord. I am a child of the King. I am saved. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. And I'm not going to let a devil, I'm not going to let a demon, I'm not going to let a distracting talk me out of what God has talked me into. Can I get you to fist bump two people around you and say, talk yourself into it? Talk yourself into it. You got to have faith that talks back. Faith that talks back. I know who I am. Faith, faith that talks back. Death must respect my purpose. When I would get on a plane, I would say, everybody on the aircraft is safe because I'm on here. And death must respect my purpose. God, you're going to uphold this aircraft by your mighty hand. And whenever the plane would hit the tarmac, I say, thank you, Jesus, for answering my prayer. Somebody shout at your boy, talk yourself into it. There's a side. There's a side of Jesus that often gets overlooked when we talk about his person and his earthly ministry. There's a side to Jesus that's overlooked, underpreached, and undiscussed when we talk about Jesus and his earthly ministry, and that is when Jesus is angry. What could cause the king of glory to be angry? What, what could actually cause Jesus to get heated? Like what gets on the king's nerves? What could cause the meekest man who ever walked the face of the earth to get heated and agitated? There are a few biblical episodes where I could show you, but due to time restraints, I'm not going to show you all of them, but there's one passage of Scripture I want to show you where Jesus is upset, and he's upset in church. <laughs> Mark chapter 3, I want you guys to see this. It's not the Scripture y'all think. Some of y'all think I'm talking about what he flipped over tables. I'm not talking about that. Mark chapter 3, verse 1, it says, another time... Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. 
Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, certain translations say deformed hand or crippled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? Nobody's clapping back, y'all. Look at this. But they remained silent. Now look at the king. He looked around at them in anger. See, this is the Jesus I like, y'all. <laughs> this, Je- like, this is the Jesus we forget about. We just think Jesus is peace be unto you. <laughs> I'm looking at this. Jesus is mean mugging in church. Like Jesus like, okay, which is lawful? To do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? Which one? He's looking at them angry. Why? The text tells us he was angry and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. So Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Now look who gets angry. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, I want to read the exact same passage of Scripture from the Message Bible. That was the New International Version. I want to read it from the Message Bible. It says, then he went back, speaking of Jesus, in the meeting place where he found a man with a crippled hand. The Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal him, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath violation. He said to the man with the crippled hand, stand here where we could see you. Then he spoke to the people, what kind of action suits the Sabbath best? Doing good or doing evil? Helping people or leaving them helpless? No one said a word. He looked them in the eye, one after another. Y'all think Jesus was scared? I said, scared? Jesus is not scared. He was looking them in the eye, one after another, angry now. Furious, look at this, at their hard-nosed religion. He said to the man, hold out your hand. I just, could you imagine how awkward it had to be to, do the, to be the man? <laughs> like you there with a crippled hand, right? And Jesus, this young dude, because remember he was in his early 30s, is staring at people. I would have been like, can I go sit down, please? <laughs> Stretch out your hand. And he held it out, and it was as good as new. The Pharisees got out as fast as they could, sputtering about how they would join forces with Herod's followers and ruin him. See, enemies will become friends when they all have a common cause. They all came together trying to figure out how they would ruin Jesus. I I want to bring your attention to verse 1, where the text tells us he went back to the meeting place. And he saw this man with a crippled hand. This meeting place, this synagogue, this temple is church. So Jesus is in church and sees a man there with a crippled hand. And that's okay. Oh, here it is. Some of us right now are crippled. It's just not your hand. It's your thoughts. It's not your hand, it's your perspective. It's not your hand, it's your heart. It's not your hand, it's your bitterness due to what they did to you. And that's okay. Because the church is supposed to be a place where the crippled can come. The church is supposed to be a place where the lost can come. The church is supposed to be a place where the confused can come. The church is supposed to be a place where people who smoke weed can come. The church is supposed to be a place for strippers to come. I'm messing your theology up. The church is supposed to be a place where those people can come who are seeking help. It's a hospital, you're right. But everybody can't be sick. Y'all missed it. It's a hospital, but everybody can't be sick. We do need some doctors. We do need some nurses. 
Jesus is also upset in Matthew 21 where he's flipping tables over. We're at in church. I believe if Jesus were to come down right now and step in what we call churches, he would be just as upset. And the reason he was so upset is because you care more about your religion than you do somebody's healing. Like this is a place where the crippled are supposed to get healed. This is a place where the lost are supposed to be found. This is a place where the confused are supposed to get clarity. This is the place where the fellowship of the unashamed meet. This is a place where you get spiritual edification. This is my church. This is where I build my church. I'm going to build my church on a rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And who is the church? You. You. Like this, this building, like the word church is ecclesia. It means the gathering of the summoned. That's what church means, ecclesia. It is the gathering of the summoned, okay? So right now, this is just a building. 10355 Mills Road, Houston, Texas, 77070. It is just a building. What makes it a church is when the summoned gather here. Did y'all hear what I just said? When y'all leave, it's a building. When we gather, it's a church. It doesn't matter if it's in your dorm. It doesn't matter if it's in your home. When we gather, it becomes church. It becomes church. Let, let's, let's go a little deeper. In Roman times, when the Roman Empire was the strongest force on earth, there was this guy named Caesar. And Caesar would have a meeting with his governors once a year. And you know what they called that meeting place? Ecclesia. So good, y'all. I'm trying to help you. He would call the meeting place Ecclesia, church. So the church is supposed to be a place where the governors meet. Okay, y'all haven't got it. I want you to get it. The church is a place where God has his official representation in the earth. They come to gather. You're not just a citizen here. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So when we have church, the governors come gather here. We're the ones that are the world changers. We're the ones that have the keys to the kingdom. We're the ones that are the ambassadors of the kingdom. So when we have church, really those who affect the world are gathering. So good, y'all. Go back and check out the Kingdom Vibes Only series. I tried to teach us Jesus came to give us keys, kingdom keys. And in the kingdom, doors never come in the form of doors. They come in the form of keys. What key, which is a principle, do you need to follow to open a door? Kingdom. Jesus walks in this church, sees a crippled man. And I want you to look at verse 2. Look at verse 2 of our foundational text. It says, the Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal him. Look, look, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath violation. So the Pharisees are the pastors, y'all. The pastors are looking to see if Jesus is going to heal somebody. Ooh. These spiritual leaders care more about their religious practices than your healing. Let's make it get real. They're pastors who care more about their following. Care more about your following than they do your healing. Care more about their platform than they do your healing. Uh-oh. Care more about the size of your offering. Why are you doing this, Holy Ghost? Care more about the size of your offering than they do your healing. They want you to still have trauma because I can monetize it. I'm in ministry off of your brokenness. That's why I don't give you scripture. I give you jokes. Because if you don't read your Bible, you won't see that I'm taking scripture out of context to deceive you. We're not getting claps there. Oh, I understand. I'm trying to get us to understand. I'm trying. I'm trying to get us to understand. There are people who legitimately like the unhealthy, unhealed version of you better. You are easier to deceive when you're broken. 
See, like, like the not understanding your worth version of you is easier to control and manipulate. When Jesus heals them, that removes our relevance. Ooh, some people are only relevant in your life because you're broken. That's it. And once you heal, they're no longer relevant. This is why they don't like your healing, because when you heal, you remove what y'all had in common. The only thing y'all have in common is orgasms. Oh, Lord. The only thing y'all have in common is dopamine hits. That's it. But once you discover, I don't need to get high to try to fill this void, this emptiness that I feel, when I discover that God gives me purpose, and God has given me a destiny, and God has given me a God-given task to work while I'm here in the earth, I don't need to get high anymore. Purpose fulfills me. Then they'll say stuff like, bro, you don't pull up on us no more. Why you don't pull up? We trying to roll up. Why don't you come through? Nah, I'm good. Oh, you forgot about us. I see how it is. You forgot where you came from. No, sir. I just refuse to live where we met. That's all. I refuse to live where we met. The only reason you're relevant is because we share the same dopamine hit. But we don't share purpose. We don't share... Our, we don't share purpose. We don't share kingdom work. When you heal... It removes people who will no longer be relevant when you discover the called out version of yourself. See, but here's the thing. You have to understand people who aren't intentional with their healing will not be support centers for yours. So stop expecting mama to support you. People who aren't intentional with their own healing won't be support centers for yours. So stop expecting for your boys to support you. People who are not who are not intentional with their own healing will not be support centers for yours. The problem becomes the problem when the problem is your normal. Mm -hmm. That's when it becomes problematic, when the problem is your normal. Because you can't go to war with a toxicity that you have now developed an acquired taste for. You, you can't go to war with the stronghold that goes undetected? How do you fight something that you can't detect? This is why that statement, what goes on in this house, stays in this house, was so detrimental for my generation and generations before us. You know why? Because it normalized dysfunction. It normalized dysfunction. Please hear me, y'all. Normalized dysfunction programs us to find comfort in a stronghold that was formed by secrets. Did y'all hear what I just said? Normalized dysfunction programs us to find comfort in a stronghold that was formed by secrets. Because the offspring of secrecy is strongholds. Strongholds. But you cannot fight a stronghold that you can't detect. You, like the unhealed version of you, a lot of people don't want you to heal, especially some of our friends, because your healing reveals their shovel. Okay, what does that mean? It means the more you heal, the more you will see that they are somebody in your life who is digging up what you're trying to keep in the grave. Who's digging up the pride that you're trying to bury, Who's digging up the lust that you're trying to bury? You're asking, God, just let me know if, if this is my husband. Girl, he makes your lust on fire and pours gasoline on it. He doesn't care about the principles of God. This isn't just women, men too. There's some men out here who are trying to live right, but she don't care about the principles of God. She doesn't care about you presenting your body to God as a living sacrifice. It's not just all men who are trifling. It's also some sisters. And the more you heal, the more it will expose who in my life has shovels. Who in my life is trying to dig up what I'm trying to bury? This is so good, y'all. But, but you won't know that. See, I told us so many times, chrysalis and a cocoon, they both produce two different things. One is a moth, one is a butterfly. A butterfly is diurnal, a moth is nocturnal. You won't know who you can fly with unless you only be able to have a season where you're cocooned. But when you're crawling, you won't know who's good for you in the next season. 
Both of us are crawling in this season. That's why you're compatible. That's why. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not that you're hard to love. Could it be your biblical intelligence has made you hard to deceive? Maybe, maybe you're not tripping. Maybe it's just your biblical intelligence has made it to where you're hard to manipulate. And they're upset because I can't manipulate you. I need you. Get back up here. I can't manipulate you. Some pastors can only pastor the unhealed version of you. And these Pharisees are proof of it. These Pharisees are proof of it. Look, y'all, once Jesus healed, the Pharisees immediately walked out to figure out how can we kill Jesus? This is Pharisaism and narcissism at its finest. I have to remove the healer where I can remain in your life. I have to kill Jesus so that you can still come to church and listen to me. Pharisaism, narcissism at its finest. If I can't control you, I'll try to control how they see you. Pharisaism and narcissism at its finest. Why are you going to that church? Mm, I heard some things about that church. Why are you going over there with them? Uh, he don't even wear suits when he preached. He probably fake like so-and-so. Why are you going over there? Try to control how you see because they can't control you any longer. They ra- look, listen, y'all. They rather kill Jesus than have Jesus heal a woman who has been crooked for 18 years in the synagogue, they rather kill him. They, they rather kill Jesus than have him heal a man who is paralyzed for 38 years and laying on a mat. And Jesus heals him and tells him to pick up his mat and walk. And the Pharisees approach him and say, it's not lawful for you to carry your mat on the Sabbath. <laughs> they rather kill Jesus than have a man who struggled to get dressed that morning because he was trying to do it with a shriveled hand. They'd rather kill Jesus than have him get healed. Pharisaism and narcissism at its finest. I'm trying to tell us this afternoon, your threat, you are a threat to the kingdom of darkness once you heal. See, it's getting quiet. I know God's touching somebody now. Listen, you are a threat to the kingdom of darkness if you heal. God wants you to heal. You know why? So that you could say what he told you to say without you keeping it on reserve because you're a people pleaser. God, God wants you to heal. God wants you to heal so that you can have a conversation and hear what's being said without your wounds rewording it, without your trauma rewording it, without your brokenness rewording it. Can you hear what they're really saying? God wants you to heal, sir, so that you can kiss your son and you can kiss your daughters so that we won't have children looking for the father's love in gangs, won't have children looking for the father's love in drugs or relationship, but they had it at home with you. God wants you to heal. He wants you to heal so that your children won't have to heal from having you as a parent. He wants us to heal. And hurting them won't heal you. Hurting them won't heal you. It won't. There's no healing in blaming. They just did me. There's no healing in blaming. Blaming is not the fertilizer for your healing. It's the umbilical cord for your bitterness. There's no healing in blaming. God wants you to heal so that you can extend his love to others without the paranoia of saying, they're going to hurt me too. They're going to hurt me too. They're going to hurt me too. I can't trust people. I can't trust people. You can't even extend God's love. I need you to heal. I need you to heal. Oh, we're not going to like this one. Some of us need to honestly audit our lives and ask ourselves, what role am I playing in my own suffering? See, what's that? One, two. See that? You see that, right? Everybody else? Yes, kiss your babies. Hold on. What about if you're suffering because of you? Right? Yeah. What, what, what choices am I making that's causing for me to miss out? Like, what is my attitude doing in my life for real? Like, what really caused that opportunity to die? Was it due to a homicide or something being purified? 
See, when, when, when it's a homicide, you killed it, they killed it, or y'all killed it together. There are a lot of homicides. There are a lot of married couples that are committing homicide. Both of us are killing our covenant. It's just him. No, both of y'all are pap 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 to your covenant. Is it a homicide or something being purified? God is trying to purify your life because of where he wants to take you because I want you to heal. And yes, it's going to be difficult. I'm just thinking when he asked that man to stretch forth his hand, did that hurt? The reason his hand was shriveled and crippled is because there was no circulation. Why don't we tell people that healing hurts? You ever broke something? When it's popped back in place, healing hurts. Stretching hurts. Do you have Bible to corroborate your claim? Yes, I do. Jesus stretched on the cross and that hurt. But it was for the healing of humanity. Healing sometimes hurts are you trying to make moves but God is trying to break chains I'm going to do this and it's 2022 and I'm going to do this and nothing seems to be working could it be because God is saying until you heal every blessing will feel like a curse opportunities and platforms that I give for you to speak on your insecurity will be heightened so much so to where you'll quit and you'll doubt me you're not healed enough for that it's not me punishing me punishing you it's me knowing that you're not healed and it hurts and sometimes you may cry but I've learned that our tears many times are watering the seeds of our evolution it hurts it's difficult but God is doing it because he wants to heal you. Setting those boundaries may hurt. You know what I've learned about people who don't set boundaries? I've always wondered why. Why wouldn't you set boundaries with something that hurts you? From counseling and from just having session after session with people, I think the Holy Spirit reveals something to me. It starts in childhood. Because parents are supposed to be the ones that teach us healthy patterns. But for many of us, parents are the ones that we should have had boundaries from. Okay? Now, because you were 13 and 14 and 15 and you could not form boundaries, you grew up learning how to be disrespected. You grew up learning how to be manipulated. You grew up learning how to deal with trauma. And so now you're an adult and you still are operating with that lethal loyalty because at 12 years old, I couldn't tell my mama to stop hitting me and stop talking to me like that. I couldn't tell my stepfather, you don't have a right to touch me like that because mama said, this is the my man. This is my boyfriend. Don't ruin my life. And because I didn't have somebody to talk to about it. Now I'm an adult that still doesn't set boundaries and it happened when you were a child. The people who were supposed to give you health gave you trauma. So now we're in the house right now. I feel it. And the house right now is hard for you to say no. There's a holiness to know. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. There's a holiness to, to know. No means, ho holy means to separate, to be separate. Sometimes you have to stay no so you can be separated from foolishness. There's a holiness to know. And you can't say no. Thank you. You can't say no because of my childhood experiences. I couldn't say no to mama. Couldn't say no to daddy. Couldn't say no to grandma. Couldn't say no to my uncle. I'm only eight. It's disrespectful to tell a parent to stop talking to me like that. You ever go in a grocery store and you hear a grown person cussing out a child? Yes. It'd be so hard for me to just mind my business. It does. I want to say something, but this, times are different. This is my child. What the, you coming on? I'm so okay. Then you're going to agitate my flesh. Hold on. Hold up. <laughs> Wait. Okay, so mind my business. <laughs> but for many of us, the reason we can't say no is due to our childhood. And Jesus was so angry, y'all. And this is what encouraged me. He was so angry because you guys are getting in the way of somebody getting healed. Jerry, why you preach so much about healing? Jesus did. I want to show y'all this. Look, let me give you Bible. Matthew chapter 8, verse 14. 
It says, and when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and he began to serve him. That evening, look y'all, that evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed some of them. Is that what your Bible says? Healed some of them. All who were sick. Give you more Bible. Luke chapter 7, verse 21. It says, in that hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. Matthew chapter 15, verse 29. I'm showing you Bible so that you can see that Jesus cares about healing. Verse uh, 29, it says, Jesus returned to the Sea of Galilee and climbed a hill and sat down. And a vast crowd brought to him people who were lame, blind, crippled, those who could not speak, and many others. They laid them before Jesus, and he healed them all. The crowd was amazed. Those who hadn't been able to speak were talking. The crippled were made well. The lame were walking, and the blind could see again. And they praised God of Israel. Here's a hard statement, y'all. The temperature of Jesus' ministry was kingdom teaching and healing. Read your Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Even if you read Acts, the temperature of Jesus' ministry and life was kingdom teaching and healing. Therefore, we, therefore, if there is ever an entity that claims to be a church, but it does not give you kingdom teaching that summons healing, that heals your marriage, that heals your singleness, that heals your heart, that heals your mind, that heals your perspective. I'm not saying it's just solely the church responsibility because you must be a participant in your own healing. But whenever we attend a group, a small group, a community that claims to be Jesus's, but there's not kingdom teaching and healing, that is a ministry in a church that's not like Jesus. Y'all see how quiet it's getting on that? Because a lot of us, Ooh, a lot of us have joined places because of entertainment. Church was great. Ooh, pastor was preaching. Church was great. Biblical church, healing, kingdom teaching. Kingdom teaching. And then it just connected with me while I was studying. You know why Jesus kept on saying the kingdom, kingdom of heaven is light, the kingdom of heaven is light, the kingdom of heaven is light, you're healed, you get sight. Healing is married to unlearning. I have to teach y'all who have gotten so accustomed to culture that you were made for kingdom. So if I could reprogram the way you think, you will start to get healed. The reason some of us are so broken is because the way you think about yourself. But if you get kingdom teaching and learn to think what God thinks about you, you will start to heal in areas. I feel like this is just therapy. All, I should have did this Thursday. I feel like this is just, just therapy. All Jesus is trying to heal us. But for many of us, we're hiding it. We're hiding it. And this, this is my concern, y'all. When Jesus told this man, come up here in front of everybody. Now stretch forth your hand. My concern is how many of us would have actually stretched forth the crippled hand. Most of us would have stretched forth the whole one. You do on social media. How you doing? Great. How you feeling? I feel great. Blessed and highly favored. The God fair Christian. Great. But truth is, there's this crippled area. There's this crippled area that you're not talking about. And when you don't talk about the crippled area, you will start having warfare in the dark. You'll start having warfare in the dark. And this is what's crazy. God is omniscient. He knows all things. He's infinite. He knows how many stars are in the sky. He knows every hair follicle on your head. He knows more about you than you know about you, but he won't heal you if you keep on hiding it. I need your permission. I need your permission. But for many of us, we hide it. We hide it. And as I'm looking at this text, I'm like, man, 
Are we hiding it because we have a lot of religious churches but not righteous churches? Are we hiding it because if I show everybody my crippled issue, they'll judge me for my crippled issue versus heal me from my issue. They won't disciple me, they'll demonize me. If they know I'm an usher and I'm struggling with this, if they know I'm in the choir and I'm struggling with this, if they know I'm a minister and I'm struggling with this, will they still see me as a son of God? God wants to heal us so that your pain is only an event, not an evolution that alters your personality. The personality that you have now is not the personality that I gave you. Pain altered it. That divorce altered it. That trauma altered it. But I need that personality back because that's the personality I need for your assignment. Like the animate itself, I need you to work in children's church. I don't even know why that flowed. It didn't even, it's off notes. I need that personality in children's church, but you lost it because of what happened. And so I need to heal you so you can have back the you that I created for you to be. The you that you've become. Now it makes sense why I think Jesus said many on that day will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. But in Jeremiah, you tell us that before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. So it sounds like a contradiction. Or could it be Jesus is saying the you that I created for you to be you never became. So this you that you are, I don't know that you. That's not the you I created. That's not the you I molded. Lost you. Pain is supposed to just be an event, not an evolution that alters your personality. All of us are going to experience pain. All of us. You know why? Because pain is the tuition of caring. Lord have mercy. Pain is the tuition of caring. The reason it hurts is because you care. So why do you keep saying, I ain't tripping. I don't even care about that. You say that publicly, but you're crying privately. Pain is a tuition for caring. When you care, then that's how it can hurt. And I wonder how many of us are hiding crippled and deformed areas. Because when we hide them, the offspring of secrecy is strongholds. You know what a stronghold is? A stronghold is anything in your life that has a stronghold. And in military terms, it is a fortress. It is a place where soldiers defend a kingdom. When we are under attack, we go in our fortress so that we could defend our kingdom. Therefore, whenever there is a stronghold in your life, it is a place where the enemy defends to maintain his grip. This is why some people are so defensive. They don't even recognize I'm so defensive and I don't like being corrected and I don't like all the wisdom because the enemy knows that love conquers all and when you love somebody you tell them the truth and what does truth do it makes you free so let me cause for you to feel some type of way towards the people who will help you be free let me let me cause for you to start looking at that brother a certain type of way and that's a god voice that i have in your life let me start having you treat your sister some type of way and that's a god voice in your life i want you defensive so i can maintain my grip I don't hug nobody. I don't, mm, I don't do all that bag bag. We're in a pandemic. You were like this before a pandemic. Somebody say facts. facts. You were like that before a pandemic. Love conquers all. And when you love somebody, you tell them the truth. And the truth will set you free. Some of us aren't healed enough to feel love. Because the stronghold caused us to be defensive. Every time somebody comes in your life, you know what that stronghold says? Defense. 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 Every time. Every time. It's a Sabbath sunrise. Sabbath sunrise, everybody's getting up, getting ready to go to church. This one guy, though, is struggling when he gets up because he has a shriveled hand. Now, the Pharisees got up just fine because they have both hands. But this man can only use one hand. He struggles as he tries to put the toothpaste on the toothbrush and brush his teeth 
because he only could use one hand, but the Pharisees could use both of them. Could you imagine trying to get dressed with one hand, trying to put his clothes on? Or what about putting your shoes on and tying your shoelaces with one hand? But the Pharisees, they could use both hands. Don't you dare let somebody who doesn't have your need try to silence your praise. You don't know what it was like trying to get dressed with one hand. You don't know what that was like. He walks in church, and I believe he sees this young Jewish guy looking ticked off at everybody. This is Jesus, early 30s, either 30, to 30 or 33, one of them. And he sees this guy, and Jesus says, come here. Come stand in front of everybody. Now, this bothered me because we learned that usually when Jesus would heal a person, he would say, don't tell nobody, right? And then when he went over to the land of the Gadarenes, he told him, okay, go and tell everybody. But I was researching all this week. I was calling my mama. I said, hold on, am I tripping? This is the first miracle I see where Jesus says, come in front of everybody. I said, okay, God. You usually tell people, don't tell nobody. You give sight, don't tell nobody. You raise Jairus' daughter from the dead, don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody. But why did you call him in front of everybody? And it blessed me, y'all. I started shouting in my office. It blessed me, I believe. Two reasons. Number one, Jesus was showing, this is what I could do if you let me heal you. I want everybody y'all see. Y'all knew how y'all knew him as crippled? I want y'all to see him now as restored. And I'm doing it in front of everybody. Now, everybody else who has a crippled issue, who's not talking about it, I want you to know to come to me because I can fix yours too. Whatever issue you're struggling with, I want you to see this is what it looks like to get healed. They used to know you as hopeless. This is what it looks like to have hope. Look at them now. They used to be broken, but now they're whole. This is what it looks like. Look at them now. They used to be confused, but now they have clarity. Look at them now. I'm doing it in front of everybody so all y'all can know I am he that healeth thee. And then I said, okay, I get that. But why would you do it on the Sabbath in front of everybody? And this part tripped me out, y'all. Jesus was flexing. <laughs> Jesus was flexing. He was like, oh, y'all say I, I can't do something on the Sabbath? Come here, bro. I can't do it on the Sabbath? Come here. Put your hand in front of everybody. Jesus was flexing because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. You know what that means? Jesus is like, okay, y'all got it twisted. You have to understand, when I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, this means I'm the only one who can exercise authority over every law because I made them. He's flexing on them. Oh, you think that I can't do this? I made the Sabbath. You're healed. Oh, I could flex on every law. The law of gravity, that's your limitation, but I can walk on water because I made all the laws. The loss of limitation of your anatomy, I can flex on them and I can have blood circulation flow right back in the same hour to this dude's hand in the middle of church. These laws don't confine me, I made them. You will have fire, like fire detectives and police confused. They wonder, how did you get out of that car accident? alive and Jesus is flexing he's like listen um, I'm the one that is a protector I'm gonna have them walk out they're confused how'd you get out of that car I'm the one go to the doctor you're not supposed to live from that car accident you're not supposed to walk again uh I made the laws of anatomy I'm gonna have a miracle in your life where they can walk again I know how to do med medical anomalies because I made the anatomy I'm the law somebody say I'm boss I'm the one that can run this, not you. I'm not limited by your laws. So Jesus was showing them in front of everybody, I run this. <laughs> He's so cold, y'all. I, I run this. Now what you say I can't do, I'm going to do it in front of everybody. And if y'all got a problem with it, y'all could try it. Y'all could even try to kill me. But you know what? I'm laying my life down. And if I lay my life down, I'm going to pick it back up again. So good, y'all give you four points and I'm done. I'm about to run off this stage. I'm trying to maintain myself. <laughs> Point number one, you weren't made to bleed for the rest of your life. Okay? You were not made to bleed for the rest of your life. This is why we constantly see Jesus healing. Because you weren't made to live like that. What have you normalized as your norm because it's been broke for so long. You weren't made to bleed for the rest of your life. 
Romans 12 tells us, do not conform to this world. Conform means to comply. Don't comply with the laws of brokenness. I'm going to transform you by the renewing of your mind. You were not made to bleed for the rest of your life. Point number two, vent, ventilate. Ventilate. A lot of us, the reason that you're not healed is because you're not talking. Your heart can't vent. When you don't talk, your heart's not venting. You have poor ventilation in your heart because you're holding what happened. When Jesus told this man to stretch forth his hand, it was the law of exposure. Stretch forth your hand. Expose what hurts. Expose what happened. I cannot heal it if you don't expose it. This is why therapy is good. Because I can't do nothing until you start talking about it. The principle of exposure. Watch this. Principles help us get over principalities. Did you hear me? Principles help us get over principalities. Until you operate in the principle of exposing what hurt, you'll forever have a heart that doesn't breathe. Number three, unlearn sabotaging coping mechanisms. Wherever you run to when you're hurt is your God. Did you hear me? Wherever you run to when you're hurt is your God. Wherever you run to when you need peace is your God. Is it your prayer closet or is it alcohol? Wherever you run to when you are hurt is your God. Because that's the one that you seek to serve you to deliverance from your pain. I have to unlearn that. I have to unlearn it. Prayer, counseling, community, discipleship. I have to unlearn that. How frivolous is it for you to hide you're hurt from the only person who can heal it. Prayer. That's where God does an MRI on the soul. And last point, reaffirming environments. Are you surrounded by people who support your healing? If everybody around you claims to be healed, don't hang in that circle. All of us, pulpit to pew to online, all of us have an area that needs to be healed. And the reason God wants to heal it is so that you could be who he originally created for you to be versus what that pain has caused you to become. So, Father God, in this moment, we hear you. We see in this passage of Scripture what makes you upset is religious, spirited people who care more about rules than they do our healing. God, we have hope this afternoon because you're the one that can heal where we're crippled. You're the one that can heal where we're deformed. Everybody right now, we look so healthy on the outside. But you know what's going on in our hearts. And the same question that I heard in prayers, the same question I want everybody under the sound of my voice to hear, how is your heart? Not your bank account. How is your heart? And how long will you deal with pain that I want to heal? That's not who you are. That's who you became due to what happened. Restore unto us our joy. And restore unto us who you cosmically created for us to be. Because we want you to get all the glory. We don't want to limit extending your love to others because we're paranoid of them doing us wrong again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.